Hi, thanks so much for joining us. My name is Lisa Haller. And I'm Jason Anderson, and uh, we too are the programmers for the Shortcuts program here at the Toronto International Film Festival. And we very much want to welcome uh, you, the viewer, to uh, the second of our uh, Q&A sessions for Short Pro Shortcuts Program 1. And we're thrilled to have uh, filmmakers here, uh, some of our very favorite films, I, I, I swear. And uh, we'd love for uh, the filmmakers to uh, introduce themselves and, uh, and say which, uh, which of their films they're here to present. Uh, hi, my name is Jordan Canning, and I'm the co-director and writer of Poor North A. Uh, my name is Howie Shaw. I'm the uh, co-director of Poor North A. Hi, my name is Taylor Montague, and I am the writer and director of In Sudden Darkness. Uh, my name is Zach Woods, and I am the director and co-writer of David. My name is David Findlay, uh, and I wrote and directed Found Me. Great, thank you so much all for being here um, and answering our questions. Um, to start, we'd love to hear a little bit more how all of your projects started. They're all really amazing and unique. And uh, we'd love to hear what your origins were for the film and any inspirations that you guys had. So we'll um, start with um, Jordan. Great. Uh, yeah, so um, For North Day kind of grew out of a uh, an idea that I had for many years and didn't really know what to do with. Um, it, it sort of was a combination of these stories that my mom told me about um, growing up on Amherst Island in rural Ontario when she was a kid spending her summers there. And it sort of coincided with something she told me once that I sort of wrote down um, like a monologue almost that she wrote about being in the hospital with her father when he was dying. Um, and so I had these sort of images of animals and death and, and I didn't really know what to do with them because it didn't really seem like it was something meant for live action, which is normally what I work in. Um, and then, yeah, years and years later, I was working with the NFB, the National Film Board on another project and learned that they could support like a live action writer and director teaming up with an animator to, to make an animation. Um, and so I brought, I kind of wrote this script and uh, brought it to them and they, they were excited about it. And so then we kind of went on a search to find an animator who would be a great fit for it. And luckily Howie's name was suggested and sent him the script and was very grateful that he responded to it. And over to you, Howie. Uh, I don't have much to add. The, um, yeah, I was, I was very, I felt very lucky to, to come on board. I mean, the only sort of uh, thing was that I had known Jordan's work primarily um, uh, as a, a comedy director. Um, and so when I read the script, I, there was a bit of head scratching to, to figure out where the joke is in here and only to realize, oh, there's no joke in here. No, it's very so, sad. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I was very uh, honored to and, and delighted to, to be brought in, into the um, uh, the film. I My, my role um, sort of evolved over time and, and uh, uh, Jordan was very, um, gracious in, in letting me work on with her uh, very closely on such a, a personal project. Great, thank you. Um, Taylor? Yeah, um, it's really interesting. So this project came together last year. I had just graduated college um, and I was going through what I've been calling like an existential crisis. You know, I was trying to figure out what's next for me, what do I do? Um, and I had long had an interest in uh, filmmaking and possibly being a director. So um, I pretty much kind of got the ball rolling on writing this story in Sudden Darkness, which is about um, a family kind of trying to navigate the New York City blackout 2003 um, because pulling from my own life when looking back and thinking about that time, that was a really formative moment for me. Um, so then I was like, okay, like, let me write this. So I started writing it and I passed it off to a colleague who then put me in touch with my producer, Eliza Soros. And we just decided, you know what, let's dedicate this summer to making this film. Um, and funny enough, our shooting dates 
fell right around the anniversary of the blackout. So it just felt kismet, it felt perfect. And I'm so thankful that I got to make this film. Wonderful, thanks. Uh, Zach, let's go to you. Um, well, I've been uh, writing different scripts and things with my friend Brandon Gardner, who co-wrote David. And um, I was interested in directing s s something. And I, I guess I, I've been thinking a lot lately about kind of um, mess um, and people's willingness to endure their own messiness and each other's messiness. Because I guess I think like that's the thing that's often most uh, moving to me is when people will sort of sacrifice their fantasies of perfectibility, either their own or their partners or their families in order to um, stay with someone, you know, to, to, to give up perfection for intimacy. So I, I had that kind of vague feeling <laughs> and I wanted to tell a story that, that captured that. And, and then also I was working, I work mostly as an actor and I was working on a movie with Will Ferrell and Will Ferrell is someone who I've always adored. Like my family would quote his SNL sketches when I was a kid. And, and I also remember seeing him in Stranger Than Fiction um, years ago and thinking he was so uh, spectacularly honest and um, unsentimental and, and direct. And, and um, it's sort of obscene that someone who is so funny can also be so um, <laughs> rooted and working on him with this movie, I got to see some of that, like some more sort of like dramatic acting. And I just got jealous. I got like so jealous of the directors because it was like watching someone play with like the greatest toy of all time. And you're like, I want to play with that toy. So, so I asked him, so we wrote it, Brandon and I wrote it and then I asked him to do it and he was like generous enough to, to, to do it. So it was, uh, partly my preoccupation with mess and partly my Will Ferrell fetish. <laughs> Great, thanks for sharing. And David? Uh, my inspiration for Found Me came from, I think, three different things. Two years ago, pretty much to this day, I myself stumbled upon the underground wrestling world of Quebec City. And I was just having a drink with some friends and we just kind of, yeah, totally stumbled into this uh, community center and we could just hear like a roaring crowd, but there were no signs and there were no lights or anything. and and I remember very vividly the feeling of opening this door, which felt like going through like a, a portal to like a parallel universe and just thinking like, wow, this exists in my city and it was packed there were like 300 people. And I guess I didn't know much about wrestling before then. I never thought about it, but I thought like, oh, like people think it's real, like what? Uh, but then very quickly I realized like, no, no, everyone is on the same wavelength that this is like sort of staged. Uh, and so in that sense, what I thought was so interesting is like this sort of palpable and collective suspension of disbelief, which is held like so high. And, and also the fact that, uh, uh, yeah, the, it's not just about the sort of uh, battle between these two wrestlers. It's about all the pageantry that's like around. That's like, that's what's part of the, the experience. Um, and so that was two years ago. And I stumbled upon that with uh, Farhad Gaderi, who's my cinematographer. And we knew like, oh, like, I don't we don't know what this is going to be, but it's, it has to be something. And, and then Mitch, uh, Michel Poudrier, my friend, who's the actor, it's his first film ever. And we'd been friends for such a long time. And I just always knew like he has such a uh, interesting kind of demeanor and, and way about himself. I think he'd be a great actor, um, but never knew exactly what that would be. And then, and then a year later, which would be a year ago now, uh, yeah, this band that I love called Men I Trust, and they're from Quebec City. They came out with a new album, and that's where I heard the song Found Me, and that's where it all sort of came together and, and made sense. And I was super, uh, yeah, kind of uh, intrigued and interested in making this sort of hybrid uh, kind of music video, but short film also that has kind of, you know, pushing that narrative uh, element to it. So. Yeah, that's that's where the uh, yeah that's where it all started. Great, thanks so much, and uh, and yeah, I think we, I mean we we are like I said just huge fans of, of all the films, and I think it's especially remarkable looking at film. I mean, we have a the balance of people who've done a couple of films, even features like Jordan versus and, and people who haven't directed before. So I just want, I would I would love to hear from from Taylor and Zach about what it's been like to sort of 
to take, you know, just to, to do directing efforts for the first time and coming from the backgrounds you do as Taylor as a, as a critic and programmer and, and Zach as a performer and writer. I mean, what was it like to sort of take this plunge, I guess? I mean, maybe uh, Taylor wants to start. Um, yeah, it was really, really interesting. So I always tell people that film criticism and, and programming was part of like my Montague film school, right? I didn't have the capacity to go to film school. I was already very much in college and very much into my degree in communications. And I wasn't starting over, but I knew that I can kind of um, learn where I could, right? So that meant befriending all the film majors. That meant maybe doing some PA work and, you know, just being really intimate with the language of cinema through the work that I was doing. So being able to make this film, you know, um, it was really interesting to to feel my way through the process of directing for the first time. I had a wonderful team and, you know, cast and crew that worked with me and all knew that I was a newbie and were really patient. And um, it, it was it was very much, you know, I often say I'm not interested in hierarchy as a director. I'm not the sole, like, auteur of this project. I had help. I had people that talked to me about, you know, me and my DP having conversations about feasibility and making sure that my vision is translated. Um, and it was just, it was really wonderful for that reason. I wouldn't trade it at all. Um, very much a steep learning curve, but it was, <laughs> it was, it was really great. I, I definitely uh, learned on the job, read a lot of books and just kind of like dived in and was like, all right, let's just do this. Um, for me, it was the opposite. I'm, I'm obsessed with hierarchy and I want to approach directing in as autocratic a way as possible. If I had to describe my directing style, I'd say it's probably like Stalinist, but I don't want to put too fine a point on it. Um, I, I think um, it's so interesting to hear you talking about it, Taylor, because it's like, it's, it sounds like sort of a similar thing in a way. Like, I feel like I just asked a million questions when I was on sets, right? Like, mm -hmm. like uh, because as an actor, it's like you have access to the greatest film school in the world because you're all around mm -hmm. all these experts in their fields. And one thing I was, I don't know if this was your experience, but I was so touched by how willing people are and eager even to share their expertise. Like you ask a sound guy, you're like, so what's the deal? Like why love versus boom or whatever? And they will give you these like really thoughtful answers that are both technical and creative and and so it just seemed like once I realized that I could do that, that I could go to all the different departments and pester them, um, it seemed like a crime not to make use of that, you know? So, so that's sort of how I learned about some of this technical stuff, which I'm still, like you said, steep learning curve. Like, um, and the other thing, I found it, I mean, I don't, I don't know if this is your guys' experience, but with like short films, there's a degree of self-selection for the people who participate because they're not lucrative and they're not, they don't even get seen usually by that many people. And so the only people I, at least I encountered were people who were in it for love of the game. And so to have your first foray into directing to be with people who are there with their whole hearts just because they love it, it's sort of the most wonderful uh, introduction to it because you just look, my as an actor or directing or anything you never want to feel embarrassed for caring right you always want there to be like as high a threshold as possible for investment and I guess I feel like it's sort of built into the structure of short films that the people there are going to be invested because they have no other reason to be there so for me it was a comfort to know that like my first time on that high wire, there was sort of a netting of the collective love and enthusiasm of all the people who were on board. But I was still a real bully to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. I guess, um, Jordan, to follow up with that, you've, you've done features and now you've, and shorts as well, and you've done TV work. You've, you've kind of done a whole spectrum of, of things in your, in your pedigree. So um, moving back to shorts, um, must have been a little bit of a change for you. But my real question is the collaboration part between you and Howie and how that worked. How did you develop and decide how to visually represent this narrative? Was it, you know, yeah, if you can kind of explain your collaboration and, and how you, how it came about, because um, the visual style is very unique as well. And the way that the narrative kind of flows is, is really unique. So if you guys want to talk about your process working together and maybe a little bit more about why you chose short form again for this story. 
Sure. Um, well, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the collaboration, it was kind of, you know, it was kind of interesting and unique. I was in Newfoundland, I was living in Newfoundland in St. John's at the time, um, and Howie was in Toronto. And so he and I never met for, I don't even know, the first year of development. Um, we sort of worked um, over the phone and, and over email and went back and forth, really taking our time, um, figuring out kind of the, the look of it. You know, I think Howie's style sort of dominates. When I saw Howie's uh, short film BAM and some of his other work when we were kind of looking at different animators, it really stood out to me. It was not at all what I would have kind of blurrily imagined when I was sort of like, what, what would this animation look like? What, you know, um, it wasn't like, I wasn't picturing Howie's stuff, but when I saw his work and the way that he kind of drew characters and had such kind of visceral emotion, um, it, I don't know, it just, it really stuck with me. And so he and I were both kind of going through some large life things <laughs> you just you just had your just found out you were pregnant with your second baby I think and no. well I not was, me but you weren't pregnant no <laughs> but you guys were gonna have another yeah. baby I'm gonna say way to <laughs> bury the lead <laughs> <laughs> it was an interesting time um and I was in Newfoundland um going through a difficult time uh, with a partner who was sick with cancer and so we didn't have this like high pressured rush um, to get through it because we just didn't have the emotional bandwidth or literally time to kind of be like, okay, let's get this out by Christmas. So it was a really a benefit to the, to the film, I think, because we, you know, would work on it together. We would kind of get, you know, by the time we got to kind of like the first animatic um, of it, I think then sort of we both had to go take a bunch of time off and then you'd come back to it four or five months later and you'd look at the script and you'd look at the animatic and be like, oh, now I can see we can cut this entire character or we can compress it down in this moment. Um, and we went back and forth like that for almost four years, I think. I, I always say it was around, I think it's around four years. Yeah. Um, and you know, animation takes some time. <laughs> and on top of that, we just let it, let it take the time it needed. And I, I think that only benefited the story because every time we came back to it with fresh eyes, it just got stronger and, and the precision of, of kind of, you know, the themes and, and how we were trying to, you know, get them across became clearer each time. Um, yeah, did I answer it? That's great. I mean, and, and maybe Howie, from your perspective, was it, I mean, was it a, was it kind of a, a, an unusual experience for you to kind of have this back and forth with, a, I mean, because you were here last with a, with a film of your own in, in 2015, which I'm sure was a very different process too. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was, it was very different in, in any number of ways. Um, the biggest one was the collaborative part um, because I am uh I don't know that I'm generally a very good collaborator. Um, so uh, he's a very it, good collaborator. <laughs> well, it was. I really think it was partly Jordan's um, openness, um, and 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 the fact that it was I, to some extent. I think it was the fact that it was such a personal story that it made it easier for me to um, uh, not keep distant, but but be sort of. Uh, have a little more humility in, in, in my own process um, uh, because I knew that Jordan's answer would always be right um, over mine uh, to some extent. But we, I mean, there were not, not that there was a lot of butting heads, but there was, um, uh, it, it was useful to know that, um, and it was again, humbling to know that Jordan trusted me to sort of interpret um, um, her story. Uh, so I think, um, the, the the main thing about the, the distance going back and forth was I think we both found that as Joan said there it um, every time we came back to it it was it was with fresh eyes and also um, the it, it's because it's about sort of a loss and uh, we I think the the idea of 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 getting distance from that loss mm -hmm. is always gives you a different perspective of, of what actually happened in that moment versus what is 
um, uh, what what you were experiencing at the time, which is a little bit sort of um, uh, what the film is about too, is is um, what you're experiencing versus what is sort of physically happening uh, there. Um, and uh, so I think we were able to sort of, it was important to us to not make it too saccharine, but then at the end, we also found that um, the last few months, I think we realized maybe we, we stepped back a little too, bit too far. Um, and so uh, we, uh, as Jordan has said before, the, we, um, our sound designer, um, Sasha Radcliffe, um, really helped us sort of um, put, a, put a point and, and round out the, the emotional sort of arc of, of the film. Great, thank you. And I just think, like, I mean, I mean, I think all the films are, are I mean, benefit. I mean, have such big emotions, and I think one bigger reason that sort of they, they all connect and resonate is, is is matters of performance. I mean, whether it's drawn performance or humans performing. But I, I guess I'd love to hear from um, Taylor, Zach, and David about the process of, of casting and finding these people, because certainly you have a great balance of people people uh, may recognize, whether it's Will Ferrell or Nehemi Ricci in, uh, in, uh, in David's film, um, or people who we haven't seen before. And I guess even David also would want to, uh, if you can also speak to like your wrestlers, who uh, I'm sure are, uh, it was an interesting casting process and actually just sort of getting their trust and their kind of like making sure that you were okay to, 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 to give you what you need for the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, casting, my friend Mitch, who's not an actor, was like just very much at, at the heart, at the genesis of it all. Um, you know, I just don't think I would have made the film without him. Uh, but, you know, he's he works in tech, but he's also a musician and has all these artistic sensibilities. And uh, we kind of, the shoot was over two weekends um, with like about a month in between. And so the first weekend was kind of like set up where it was just shots of him driving or shots of him just doing kind of easy stuff so you could get um, familiar and, and comfortable with the camera uh, to then, you know, in the second weekend do the, these bigger scenes. Um, yeah, the wrestlers, yeah, that was kind of tough sometimes. Basically, you know, we, I knocked on the door of this community of wrestlers saying like, I want to make a film and, and they're like, oh, and it's about a guy who wants to become a referee and they're like, oh, that's kind of cool and interesting referee uh and so yeah the, there's like two main wrestlers marco estrada who's like just this who comes off as this total meathead uh but then when i met him i was like actually kind of like nervous and he's just like the sweetest guy who totally is like fully self-aware you know of his character and his his persona you know sort of on the ring and off um and and turned out to be so so great and such a fun time uh casting Naima Ricci um yeah I saw Antigone on the plane like a month before we shot and was blown away and I just kind of looked her up online and called her agent and initially it was no she can't do it and I was so sad uh that I like I called again saying like well you know if it is a scheduling thing like we could kind of we're flexible you know and I remember that day being like super stressy and anxious and they called back and I'm like, okay, yeah, we can, we can make that work. And, and putting Mitch, my good friend with Naima together in these scenes was, was just the greatest joy, uh, you know, from just, you know, an actor who's, you know, that's her profession uh, and someone doing it for the first time. And I only learned this later on, but Mitch was telling me like, yeah, Naima was so, was so sweet. She gave me all these different tips, all these different little, little cues you know I, I remember him telling me you know at some point she told me um it starts before action and it it continues after cut and I thought that was so sweet and such a nice little tidbit for him to to kind of think about you know as someone uh you know being in front of the camera in a film for the first time ever so yeah directing these actors was uh the best part of it by far for sure great thanks and maybe um, Taylor can, can talk to, to sort of finding the people she needed. Because again, like, and also working with uh, a child lead is also another particular challenge, I'm sure. Um, yes, uh, I kind of echo David's sentiment about working with actors being one of the best parts of making this film. Um, 
Yeah, it was really, it was a really interesting process. Uh, I should preface this by saying I love actors. Um, I spent a lot of time at the theater. Um, and so that's how I kind of came to encounter my lead, Marcus Callender, who plays Jerome, which is like the father in this film. I had saw him on Broadway and Lynn Nada just play Fabulation. And he just killed it. He played like five different characters because they rotate the, the cast sometimes throughout the show. And I remember like just storing that in my head, like, okay, this is a talent, right? So someone I have to work with one day. And I didn't know how soon it would be because I saw the play in March and I was like reaching out to him in June. But um, he was one of the first people I casted. And um, from there, uh, I had like dream actors in mind. It's like Raven Goodwin, who plays Erica, who's the mom. Um, I grew up seeing her face on, on television, right? She's like a very seasoned actress. Uh, she was on Just Jordan, which was a show to watch and Everybody Hates Chris. And she was also on Being Mary Jane in which she plays a mother. So when I needed someone for this role, who was also like um, a big thing for me, like the parents are kind of young, right? Which is what was important. Um, but I knew that she had worked with children. I knew that she had played a mom. I knew that she could offer this kind of nuanced perspective to black motherhood, which was really important to me. Uh, so we ended up reaching out to her and we actually heard back, like, I think like a week before we were set to shoot. So I was definitely really taking a chance on that. And I was holding out hope that, yeah. you know, she would, she would be in the film. Yeah. So it worked out. Um, the child actress I found through Instagram on a child's like agency page and um, it was really interesting reaching out because I know her parents run her account so I was just like hey I'm not a creep <laughs> very much interested <laughs> in your daughter coming on board for this project and she auditioned and she was absolutely Tati like as soon as she left I looked to my left I looked to my right everyone agreed it was her um but yeah, also shout out to Instagram because Instagram DM is also how I got in contact with Marcus. So honestly, that's how I primarily casted this film. And it all just really worked out and it was all really wonderful. Um, and yeah, I have my acting debut in this film too. So I was going to say, don't forget. I know, I know. I don't know if this Q&A comes before or after, probably after. So people get to see, you know, I didn't want to spoil it, you know. But yeah, I was really excited to be in front of the camera. Everyone would you watch it. playback of yourself? Like, like, when, would you direct yourself or would you have someone else watch when you were acting in it and then? Basically, I had like two takes to get it right. Oh. And so yeah, I did have to like run to the, the, the screen, run to the monitor and then like try to figure it out. But I don't have that many lines, so don't worry. I'm not like, I'm not like the, the star of this at all, right? It's very much That's a cameo. <laughs> like, I feel like if you have a lot of lines, you get a, like a chance to settle into it. But if you just have like, a little moment that you have to like it's like landing on an aircraft carrier you know it's like you're like oh god i hope i i was rehearsing with my mom like nearly <laughs> every day i was like these are actors and i'm coming in here like i need to make sure that you know i earned this you know yeah. it doesn't feel like vanity it doesn't feel like narcissism or anything even though it might partially be but uh <laughs> yeah it was really wonderful everyone was wonderful that's thank you and I, and, and and zach it's i was just thinking about kind of the the weirdly perverse thrill of getting like, you know, getting not just Will Ferrell, but uh, w William Jackson Harper of The Good Place and getting these two guys who can go big and then get, getting them to go under <laughs> the other actor. I mean, what was that process? I mean, I guess, I guess sort of bringing those actors into the fold, but also kind of figuring out a way to sort of surprise people with the performances too. Well, I, with William Jackson Harper, I saw Patterson years ago, the Jim Jarmusch movie, and and he's in it and he is just so funny and so quiet and heartbreaking and I just adore you know it's the same thing you're describing at the Linnanich play where you just like it's crushes you get crushes like like casting is, feels like almost romantic or like when you're talking about like oh I didn't know she was going to be able to do it it's like waiting for a date or something you're like please I love you please love me back <laughs> you know like so I, I had like an immediate crush on, on William Jackson Harper's acting and same thing with Fred Heschinger, who, who's the third character in the uh, play. I don't like he's gesturing with a pen like I'm Bob Dole. But there's a, with uh, uh, Fred, I'd seen him in eighth grade and uh, he had a little part, but you know, it's the same thing. It's like, it, you see, it's like across the room at a party, you're like, you, um, you just feel it. And um, yeah, and uh, what am I trying to say? I guess, 
I like casting that's um, fun. You know what I mean? Like, hopefully casting that isn't distracting, but like, I remember seeing that Safdie's, Safdie Brothers movie, The Good Time with Robert Pattinson, and I didn't see it for a long time because I just sort of thought, oh, it's probably like a Twilight movie or something. And then I, I saw it and, and I was like, it was as, as beautiful as that movie is, it was even like, it felt more fun to me because it's like, that's Robert Pattinson playing the character. Like, I like it when you see people you know, it's sort of mischievous casting. I just, it makes it more like a, ooh, this is like a, a treat. And then, yeah, I think it just, for me, it just feels like, um, well, did you guys ever read The Velveteen Rabbit? No. Do you know that book? Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Such, like, I'm obsessed with that book, but basically in the book, it's like this toy rabbit asks this older horse what real is, like what makes you real. And the horse says, it's like when a, a child loves you for a very, very long time and not just to play with, but like really loves you, then you become real. And there's this whole beautiful conversation that I won't uh, torture you with. But, but I think like finding actors, I, I feel like making things is like you are trying to love something until it becomes real. So when you're writing, you're trying to love the character so they become real. And when you're acting, you're trying to love the character so they become real. If you love them enough, they'll become real to other people too. Um, and so you, and I think if, if you love the actor, <laughs> it makes it easier. The, the more love that's sort of floating around, this sounds so like, you know, but, but the, the more love that's sort of ricocheting among the participants, both fictional and real <laughs> in a story, the better. And I just love those guys. So that's sort of how I cast them. Sorry, that was long winded. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much. Oh, Lisa, are we, how, are we, um, are I think we need to one more, maybe? Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Well, what we, what we <laughs> really, uh, talking from your, your characters, they're all so authentic and they really resonate with the viewer and you immediately sucked into each one of your films. And that's what really, um, compelled us about your films. And it's not only the connections between the people or the characters, it's also the impact that they make on one another, whether it's, you know, in a difficult situation or a transition period in their life or, you know, a crisis um, in some cases, they all make positive impacts on each other. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. So um, I guess my roundabout question is, um, Everyone is kind of isolated right now. We're all coming together to watch this program from, you know, all across the world in some instances. And the way that we're hoping that these films, we know that these films are going to connect with them. So if there's anything that you want to say on whether or not, what, I guess, no, sorry. My question is, <laughs> if there's one takeaway that you want the viewers um, to have from your film, what would it be? That's a very long-winded um, question, but um, if there's one thing that you want the audience to take away from your film, what would it be? Um, I, I guess, um, it, you know, there's the, the For Nord Bay, you know, it's, it's about a lot of things. It's about, um, you know, grief and loss and, you know, um, life, you know, being unresolved, relationships ending before they resolve and you never really getting the closure that you kind of fantasize about getting. Um, but I, I think what I've always wanted, and I, I know it's kind of a, a bummer movie to watch sometimes, but um, I, I, I really always, you know, it's that moment of connection between these two strangers in the end um, that I hope is the takeaway, you know, that in addition to these sort of stories, my mom told me about her losing her father and, and kind of trying to understand his death and their relationship. You know, the, the, the secondary character is sort of a, a representation of me um, in this hospital going through what I was going through at the time. And it was always this sort of, imagination of like, what if me and my mom, you know, at kind of two of the, you know, saddest, most isolating times of our lives had somehow been able to cross paths in, in this hospital, spending day after day in this hospital. And what if, you know, 
you know, you could have just found that connection, even if it's just for a moment. Um, and I think that's what, you know, we need to remember. And I mean, we, yes, we've been so isolated. And then sometimes I like go out to get my mail and like make eye contact with a stranger and I tear up because I'm like, <laughs> humans, <laughs> I remember uh -huh. humans. Um, and I think we will get there again. You know, we will be able to connect and touch one another again. And so that, that I hope is the, the takeaway is like, even if, you know, you're not able to see, you know, I haven't seen my family in almost a year now, but we will be able to see each other again. And in the interim, we should be looking for those moments of connection wherever we can find them. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, on top of what Jordan has said, I, I think, uh, and touching on one part of what Jordan said specifically is, is this notion that um, you never really get the resolution you want um, and the completeness of an experience that, that you want, especially when it comes to sort of close, um, close loved ones. Um, and uh, I think it's about accepting that and kind of loving the pain of it and the, the, um, uh, the dissonance of it uh, as well as, um, and trying to let the, 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 uh, the bigger moments, the, the more sort of um, hallmark moments uh, sort of inform the, the dissonance and, and vice versa, I, I think. Um, and I, I, I think in this moment of, of sort of outrage, uh, maybe that uh, notion is, is particularly um, uh, useful, hopefully. It's incredibly moving what you guys just said. <laughs> I just miss people, you know? <laughs> I'm just reading off of Wikipedia. <laughs> How is it more on psychopath? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think what you were saying about um, connecting with people, it's like, and, and, and looking at your neighbor across the street and stuff, it's like, I think some of my lo least lonely moments in my life have been in theaters, yeah. um, watching people or on sets. But as an audience member, I feel so kept company by characters and by the people who are making the characters come alive and i need company like you said like we need company and sometimes even that company can feel more immediate than geograph geographical proximity sometimes access to somebody's spirit can feel more steadying than being shoulder to shoulder so i guess you know my hope is that for the movie, my movie, but also watching your guys' movies and and movies generally, that it'll allow us to reach across geography to, to connect in in maybe even more uh, sustaining a way. I think. All right. Thank you. I think Taylor may be uh, freezing out a little bit, but um, but David, if, if Dave wants to talk about uh, so last sort of takeaways yeah. as well mm -hmm. i guess i guess oh oh Sorry. is taylor back taylor's back okay i'll just go um yeah i guess i wanted to make a film um about sort of self-realization or self-actualization i suppose i wanted to make an intimate portrait of like a an uber relatable any man that anyone can sort of see themselves um, you know, in, through, um, wanting to like convey every person's need to like realize themselves and their ambitions to reach that full sort of transcendent self, no matter how big or small or normal or totally bizarre and niche that desire for self-expression may be. Um, and there's, and what struck me, there's like a, a nice piece of lyric in the song Found Me by Man I Trust that says, listening to that sense of truth coming from within. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's like really good. I like that a lot. Um, and so I guess it, I wanted to make a film that's like about, uh, I guess, getting out of the house metaphorically, obviously not in these days, but getting in tune, finding your music, just uh, letting the world find you in a way. Because, um, you know, I guess this character Mitch is like looking for 
himself, but uh, he ends up, you know, kind of stumbling upon something that that strikes him. So, yeah, that was that was the same. Thanks. And and Taylor, I guess you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's, I think your film is very moving and definitely feels like it's kind of coming at a, a time where I really appreciate the sort of emotions that are that are there. Yeah, thank you. Also, my sincerest apologies about whatever happened before. I'm sorry about that. You know. Uh -oh. oh no, we're still losing you. Can you? Oh, but it's also like frozen with like the sweetest fish. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think you're coming through. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, okay, should I start to start over? Please, yeah, if you can. Okay, cool. Let's hope this works all the way through. Sorry about that. Okay. So, um, a theme that I want people to take away, or what I want people to take away from this film, is community. Um, that was something that I think is not only a, a, a major part of the film, but is like baked into the filmmaking pro uh, process of making this film. You know, I'm a product of my community. Tati is meant to be a product of a community very much. Um, that's why the kind of neighbor comes down and checks on them. It's supposed to kind of, you know, break you out into see, realizing that these people are being held accountable. And, um, or, you know, there's accountability process in the building. People care about who lives there. People check in on one another during these times. Um, and also just down to like filming the film uh, in my grandmother's apartment, right? And having the neighbors kind of cheer us on and kind of peek in and want to know what's going on. I mean, that community uplifted us and gave us their space and collaborated with us so that we could make this movie uh, the way that it's meant to be made and have that authenticity a part of it. So that's definitely um, a, a big takeaway. It's just the importance of community, the importance of love, care, and tenderness um, is everything that this film is about. Amazing, thanks so much. And thank you, that's all the time we have. And I just wanna thank uh, all of you for all the work you've done on these films and, and to, to thank you so much for sharing them with us because they, they mean a lot to us and we hope they mean a lot to, to everyone who gets to see them. So again, thanks very much. And uh, we look forward to whatever's next. Thank thanks you guys. Thank you everyone. Thanks. I thank wish we you all guys. got to meet each other. Yeah, what <laughs> I know. Yeah. Bummer. Oh well.